everyone, and welcome to Fathoms Deep, a Black Sales podcast from Common Room Radio. I'm Liz Stevens. And I'm Daphne Olive, and we are doing our special mythology episode, and we have two amazing guests with us. One is Alistair Stevens. Hello, it's a pleasure to be back with you again. And our other guest is John Steinberg. Hey, guys. How you doing? I feel like I just keep saying this over and over again, that every episode we've been doing since the finale is just me being self-indulgent, but this one really is. This is something that... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> this is something that Liz and I maybe talked about a really long time ago that we would love to have Alistair and John in a virtual room with us. And cheers, we've got that. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, just talk story and story building, right? I like this. Yes. Well, and mythology, and which mythology. is actually the yeah, topic. About which I know nothing. So <laughs> I'm very interested. So everything I know about mythology, I learned from watching Jason and the Argonauts and Clash of the Titans as a kid on repeat. <laughs> That's totally fair. And... That's totally fair. <laughs> <laughs> an education right there. Yeah, uh, the Disney Hercules movie, I'm pretty sure is wrong about everything. So I'm just going to let that one go. <laughs> A lot and, of Clash yeah. of the Titans. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. All right. Clash Good of the stuff. Titans. Yeah. That was my si- my sixth grade graduation party. We all went out to see that. Wow. <laughs> Fun times. So, yes. And on that topic, what I wanted to say is we are going to talk mythology. I'm very oriented towards Greek mythology. One of the reasons... I understood that Black Sails was going to be my show was episode two, when suddenly Flint's talking about Odysseus. Of course. So amongst the four of us, no one is an expert by any means. Mm -hmm. Uh, We have varied amounts of knowledge about, uh, well, about both Black Sails and about any type of mythology. Um, And listeners, you don't need to necessarily, we're going to do our best to just explain stuff while we go along. Uh, And if you're not, if you've never heard of something... Wikipedia is your friend. True. (laughs) What I wanted to say is anyone who knows more about especially Greek mythology than we do, which is going to be a lot of you, please email us. I would love like to hear any theories you all have, any reactions you have to our crazy theories, because we're going to do some crazy theories. Even though we have John here in the room with us, we're going to sometimes ask John to wear his creator hat and sometimes wear his audience hat so that we can talk about our crazy ideas. Mm All right, let's get started. Let's go. Okay, the first topic I wanted to talk about was the mythology of the original pirates of the Golden Age. I know some of them are actual characters, but I feel like the characters in Black Sails have kind of their own mythology of of the original pirates, especially Henry Avery, and but also Sam Bellamy and Henry Jennings. And Teach is also one of the original pirates uh, who comes back to us. I just wanted to talk about like how different characters in the show respond and relate to the mythology of within the world of Black Sails. I think um I mean it's it's clearly a a world building exercise when you undertake something like this. You can't treat it as a historical even if you weren't dealing with the Treasure Island text. I don't think you could treat this as a historical um a straight historical narrative. There's just you don't know enough about it. And, and, and even if you purported to make a show that was the, the honest truth about what happened to these people, you'd be making it up. Um, and so once you start world building, I feel like that becomes part of the job. How do you make that world interesting? How do you make it feel like it's um, a world that um, feels like it's fertile for story? Mm. Um, some of that is um, some of that's deliberate at the beginning. Some of it's not. You grow into it. And, and I think that's some of probably the reason why um, season one and season two are so different is that there, um, even for me, in trying to figure out who are these people, where do they fit into this world? I, I thought I knew who they were at the beginning, but it's so much harder to build people out of nothing than it yeah. is to contextualize people in a story that you're beginning to care about. Um, and so I, I think, um, you know, there are things that didn't happen until late, like the as an example, um, I think I always had a sense of the people that came before these people, that they weren't the first generation, that there was this, uh, the old school, old neighborhood gang um, <laughs> that was just bigger than them and and purer than them. Um, mm. And I think that there are really sound mythological bases for that. Um, you know, and, and I think um, if you were looking at it in that light, um, it feels Norse. It feels Greek. It feels like there are these giants that sort of existed before us, before the men showed up. 
Um, I wasn't thinking that way at the beginning. I sort of, some of that was just kind of like pulled together from the record and some of it just kind of felt right, which I think is a, a, how a lot of this operates. Um, it's total seat of the pants and you mm -hmm. kind of hope that you recognize something from a class you took at some point. So you can start to like sand the edges down around it. But that was some of it was sort of giving, making sure that it felt like you were walking in people that it wasn't the beginning. The deeper you got into the story would support it. And, you know, trying, trying to create a superstructure on the fly essentially for um, a story that you don't know where it's going to go or how long it's going to go or what it's going to ask you to do or what pieces you've put in totally the ass backwards place. And then you have to start rearranging things. Mm -hmm. um, it's um, it's complicated. Horrifying, daunting. Um, yeah. All of those things. <laughs> all of those things. <laughs> and, and more of them. Yeah. It, it's the, the more I sort of get some distance from the show, um, because, I mean, the learning curve for me was huge. I've never written a story that long. I've never been responsible for a story that long. And so the, the I learned a lot. You know, I learned a lot in three seasons about what a story that long has to do in order for it to kind of keep the ball constantly in the air. And getting away from it further, I think I'm starting to appreciate a thing that TV does that that I don't know that really any other medium does. It's not a novel. A, a novel can um, can stop in a way a show can't. It can take a breath. It can meditate. It can whatever. Like, a show has to constantly be doing that thing where like if you don't care about civilization and you don't care about all the intellectualizing and you just want to see pirates be awesome it has to do that too and it has to do that in a way where it's structurally elegant so i don't get myself into a box that i can't get out of so it has to do all those things but at the same time you are trying to elevate it to something that feels like a novel and there's just movies aren't asked to do that movies have an ending that they can be crutching on right, right from the beginning mm -hmm. and i think it's for the reason why there just there aren't a lot of shows that begin sustain and end great um, Definitely. at least not for me and and maybe i'm jaded from being in it but there's just not a lot like and it's because it's really hard um and and i think having been through it now it's obvious to me why there aren't it's really hard and the deeper you go into it the more impossible it gets to the point where you're just guaranteeing there are going to be huge chunks in it where we had no idea what was going on and we were just sort of treading water so i think is why we wanted to get out like the moment you realize that that is almost a certainty the longer the story goes the more hold the red handle on the subway car and get off as soon as you can. So, and I don't even know if I knew this at the beginning. You just try to like find people you're going to give a shit about and point them in a direction that feels vaguely like a story. And then that's where I feel like the chops come in of as they're going, making sure that you're building the road ahead of them in a, in a way that feels like um, a world. Hmm. I like that. I think you definitely you. did that. Definitely. I definitely gave a shit from the beginning to the end. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that's good. Great. We, we've said that a lot on the internet, that we <laughs> that we give a shit. There was definitely a sense for me of all of these characters kind of standing on the shoulders of giants, mm -hmm. you know, of, of having, because there were so many name drops that anybody could catch. And I knew nothing about pirate history, but e even I could pick up on some of these things. And um, I think the shadow cast by Blackbeard was really strong um, and showing, I, I think about, the different kind of epic mythic moments that we had even in even in yeah. season one. <laughs> um, and I think of, gosh, I think of Flint on the boat, of course, but also of like the resurrection of Charles Vane. And then how when you mm -hmm. see that he was the one who was immediately under the wing of Blackbeard, that kind of makes sense because Blackbeard was such a giant. So these two as being like, you know, uh, both titans, I suppose, made a lot of sense to me. It was mm -hmm. a beautiful thing to watch. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting, actually, like going back to, I mean, because Avery's mentioned in the beginning, right? Like yeah. he's the one who um, was the one that existed before there was any order to it. Um, but the reason um, Blackbeard isn't in the first season is that I didn't have to do with him. Um, yeah. And we didn't want to just introduce him in a way where he was just going to be another vein or another flint. Um, it just, he sat on a shelf. Um, until we could figure out a way to introduce him. And so knowing that there was this thing out there, that it was really um, a class of one that was that was Avery, then they're in the same way that these stories have evolved. It went from one to a number of them. And then it wasn't just Avery who didn't really have anything to do. It was Avery who sat above Telemi and all these other guys, and then he had a place to stand. And so like, th I think that's sort of what I'm talking about in terms of how these worlds start to build themselves. Um, that they're constantly, right. you have to read them forward, you know, read them forwards and read them backwards at the same time. And I think Blackbeard got read into that mythology and, and in doing that, 
um, it, their it game structure. Um, because it wouldn't make any sense otherwise. Like, I think there were a lot of bad ways to introduce that character into the show um, for a season or two and just decided, like, when it's ready to introduce them, we'll know. And, mm-hmm. you know, we'll know. And also, like, the concept for me of the old pirates, as I keep calling them old, that doesn't seem like the right word, but the original pirates. <laughs> the original pirates. pirates. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, it's funny that Liz said Titans, because that's going to come up in my next question. But, um, but <laughs> we can just call them the Titans, because I, I jokingly started to call them that in my notes, because because of the whole concept of Jack standing next to giants and me thinking about Greek mythology, I started to call them the Titans. Um, so... The older pirates slash titans of this mythology um, made a really good kind of centerpiece for the characters to revolve around, like, and so that you could see a lot of character stuff in how each of them related to them. So, like, you know, we have Jack, obviously. We know where Jack stands. He wants to be all, he wants to be with them. He wants to be among them, stand next to them. Whatever, whatever it is that Jack really wants. <laughs> and then I felt like Flint from the beginning is presented as like the anti them. You know, the way Hornigold is so is so contemptuous of Flint being right. kind of this new this new version of piracy, this new vision for for Nassau. And I just I felt like for me, like looking back, it kind of gave me a sense pretty, pretty early on of like how who the who these people were because of who they were in relation to this mythology of their own place right and yeah. what nasa is in a sense i think that this is one of the most interesting things about this entry point into the story as a whole is that i guess what what differentiates a story from a myth is that a myth leaves its impression in the cultural fabric it leaves its impression in in the society and nasa is defined in part by these myths because it would be easy or it wouldn't be easy, it would still be incredibly difficult, but it would be an option to have our characters come in and name check Avery and name check Blackbeard and have this be a kind of golden age thinking where we just have, oh, the great days are behind us, but that doesn't really matter. They they are just individual figures, but instead the creation of this consolidated kind of aggregate mythology gives us a sense of Nassau because this place has been changed by these stories. That's the the power of myth in terms of our entry point into NASA and into, of course, all of the individual characters. I think it's I think it's a titanic accomplishment to borrow your pun there, Daphne. <laughs> <laughs> We're just going to use like every word for giant. <laughs> exactly. Um, no, I mean, I think that, that so that was, you know, among a lot of kind of feeling around choices made by by feeling around in the dark. Um, it was a conscious decision when we started when we were looking for an entry point to start at the end. Um, or at the beginning of the end, um, mm-hmm. and to essentially start in the moment in which people were first starting to say, "I think this is this can't last forever." Mm-hmm. And I think if you really dug at that, it's probably for that reason that stories about that if you were telling a story about Avery, understood as he is in this um, in this mythology, it's a story about Zeus without people, um, and that's not quite a story. Like it's um, it's foundational, but it's not something to be invested in because it's, it's just not like, I think you need people to show up in the story and mm-hmm. they're flawed and they can't quite stand up to the stories they've been told about what came before them. And, and I think, um, I, I don't know that I could have done all that math at the beginning to explain why it just felt right to mm-hmm. start in a moment that felt really compromised and that felt like you understood, um, and that everyone was fully aware of their own mortality, I guess maybe is, is, is the difference. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it, it's also like, it's very young, right? That 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 Flint walks in and is kind of this um, this person who's standing between both worlds. That he's both larger than life to everyone who was there, um, but is in opposition to all of the people who came before him. I, I think there were elements of what became the Flint Silver story, which, which to me is really um, kind of a story about a person talking to themselves. For all of the kind of um, dancing around in, in dialogue about. Um, um, internal conflict and sort of, you know, m- multiple selves and, and, and multiple voices happening in any one moment, sort of vying for um, control of self. But that's what it was. And, and, and I think that Flint was kind of in, in a, a really kind of proto form in, in season one of, of starting that story before I knew Silver was going to fit into it and, and how that was going to work. But I think that's probably why. I think that 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 Young's a smart guy. And, and I think that there is something that just is sort of instantly... Um, <laughs> Uh, resonant and, and understandable um, about that place 
um, that, that real estate of sort of standing between the gods that came before you and, and where the rubber meets the road um, for, for people. I like it. All right. How would you all feel about playing my little casting pirates as Greek mythology oh, gods? Let's do it. Eager. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. <laughs> okay. Well, so this did start as a joke because I guess it was a joke with myself when I started writing the notes for this episode that I did call the old uh, pirates and then I wrote next to it giants because of Jack. And then I was like, oh, wait, if they're giants, they must be the Titans. And then I decided that if they are the Titans then Teach has to be Prometheus. So uh, just a quick version of the Prometheus story is that he was the Titan that created humans and he loved humans. And so he tricked Zeus to help the humans and Zeus got really mad. And then Zeus basically uh, condemned him to be tortured for decades. How, you know, how long? I don't know how long. He was <laughs> until, He's for a really long time. So I decided that if Teach is Prometheus, then that means that Woods Rogers has to be Zeus. <gasps> because he also chains chain teach up and tortured him. <laughs> Thank you, John, for that. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry, listeners, for me bringing that up. Um, so then I was just like, I was like, okay, well, if I'm going to do this, I might as well keep going. So I'm going to go through and tell you all how I ended up casting everyone, and tell me if you all disagree. Definitely, I'm, I'm really you curious. Move on. From the yes. brilliant Woods Rogers is use comparison. Can you break that down a little for, for those who perhaps aren't uh, as familiar with the, the nature of the conflict between Zeus and Prometheus? What is Woods Rogers' goal in this metaphor? If we're casting them as these characters, what is it that he's pursuing to you? Sure. Okay. So Prometheus basically loved humans and wanted to help humans, and Zeus wanted to basically have all the power. <laughs> Uh-huh. Yeah, the, the gifting of fire to mankind in the Promethean myth, right. representing it in power. Yes, exactly. And, and exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Fascinating and oddly heartbreaking, too. Very heartbreaking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Again, thank you, John. Uh- <laughs> of course. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so I don't know, this started as a silly game. And then it I was like, wait, this actually kind of works. Okay, so I'm going to go through characters. And I feel like I forgot characters. So tell me if I forgot anyone. Um, and I didn't manage all the gods, but I managed most of them. And I loved like going back to Jung, the idea that that the basically the Greek pantheon is covers all of the archetypes that cover basically all of humanity, which we've said many times about black sails that it that you all made possibly the most human story we've ever seen, even though it's about pirates a long time ago, but it just is very, very universal. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so like suddenly this started to be kind of meaningful for me. I don't know. Like it's, yeah, it's, <laughs> I guess it's, it's a short, it's a short walk in my mind from something that's being silly to something that's being meaningful. Okay. So uh, I'm going to start with one that seems pretty obvious. I would say that Thomas is Apollo. Apollo being the god of the sun, but also light and truth and the principles of rational consciousness and uh-huh. thinking. Okay. okay, sounds good. I'm on board. Okay, all right. So the next one after that would be Miranda, who I actually split into two goddesses. Oh, and please, everyone, excuse me if I pronounce anyone incorrectly. I grew up, <laughs> grew up my whole life loving Greek mythology, partly because my name is in it, uh, but never was schooled on how to pronounce things. Okay, so Miranda (laughs) Hamilton is Athena, the goddess of wisdom. Then when she is in NASA, Miranda Barlow, who we know better, is Hestia, who is the goddess of the hearth. Mm. That makes perfect sense. I like that a lot. Yeah. And teacups. And teacups. teacups. (laughs) Hearths and teacups. (laughs) And whatever the good smelling, did we ever figure out what the good smelling thing is? What does he smell? Yeah, John, what's the the good smelling thing? What is it that he sniffs? In the first season? Yes, yes. When Flint first goes to Miranda's oh, I think house. It, I think it was, I assumed it was just tea. That's what we That's said. That's what I assumed. Yeah. Like a very yeah, small yeah. canister for tea for, you know, let's, a Brit. Let's go but. with tea. There you go. <laughs> let's go with tea. Perfect. Mystery solved. Yes. There exactly. we go. It goes with, like goes with tea That's cups. Very I'm appropriate talking, so. for Miranda's mm-hmm. house. Okay. Next up. So, uh, so far, no one's arguing with me, huh? No, this no. Okay. Next, good. You're genius. Yeah. next up is my favorite threesome. Excuse me, John. I know you you know that we say this, but of Janex. Um, <laughs> <laughs> 
So uh, I will tell another Greek mythology story is that uh, Hephaestus, who's the god of forging, of craftsmanship, basically, is married to Aphrodite, the goddess of love. But Aphrodite cheats on him with Ares, the god of war. Uh, So Ah. what I decided, I did a little flipping because you all, John and company, so good at gender flipping and flipping things in general that from our expectations, I cast Anne as Aries. I think that one, I think, I think most people wouldn't argue with me about that. Mm -hmm. Max is Aphrodite, which makes Jack have faced us. Sorry, Mm -hmm. Jack, which is uh, not owe Jack an apology for that comparison. (laughs) <laughs> That's Who a is the comparison? <laughs> the official Greek mythology cuckold who takes his energy and puts it into creativity. The maker of things, absolutely. Yeah, that seems very appropriate. It does a flip bit because because he, because then Hephaestus is with Ares, not with Aphrodite, mm-hmm. and Aphrodite is how could Max be anything but? Right. Honestly. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's lovely. Okay, and the last next one is uh, Eleanor is Hera. Mm. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> who is the lady in charge who's sometimes motivated by anger and other things. Um, and then my favorite one is that Maddie is also Athena. Mm. That, that, that that role shifted from Miranda Hamilton to Maddie. Sure, sure. I can see that. There's a gap in our pantheon at that point. Yeah. The next one is Charles Vane is Poseidon. And I actually really love this, too, because Poseidon is the god of the sea. Mm-hmm. I have to credit our listener, Cuppy, who she and I talked about that, and she was talking about the different elements and how the earth is something stable to us and the sea is something that we can't control. And I said, but the cool thing about Poseidon is that he is also the god that controls earthquakes. Mm -hmm. So he's actually the person who takes the uncontrollable nature of the sea and imposes it on humans on the earth that they think is so stable. And that seemed oh. to me like the perfect metaphor for Charles Vane. Yeah. yeah. No, that's lovely. Plus, there's something about the dreadlocks and Poseidon that works for me as he's like swimming through the water, remember? Like that, that just works. <laughs> I'll take it. Are we in class for the time? I might be. That's fair. That's good. <laughs> um. <laughs> Toby's mom was in class for the Titans. What? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Did you not know that? I don't remember that. Yeah, I do Toby's now. Mom is Hera. Yeah. Of course. God, it's been so long. But of course, wow. now I remember that. Oh. Okay, now we have to. Well, now we need to organize a live tweet. I know. Yeah, uh, yeah, we're totally, we're totally are watching that. <laughs> that. That's going to be real. Okay. Fun. Yeah, that's officially happening now. Yes. <laughs> awesome. Okay, I'm almost done. Um, and so far, you all haven't argued with me. I was I was waiting for someone to argue with me. Okay, Silver is Hermes because he is the messenger god. So he is actually the messenger between the gods and the humans, uh, uh-huh. just like Silver was basically Flint's messenger to the crew. Uh, he's also he's also the god of boundaries who can cross boundaries, and that seemed to me very appropriate. Oh, for, sure, for Silver. Yeah, this is my favorite piece of casting. I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Really? Oh, I'm so glad. Yeah. Billy, I don't know what to do with Billy. I, I cast him as Artemis just because he's maybe a virgin. <laughs> I don't know what to do with it. John, what are we going to do with Billy? What do we do with Billy? <laughs> um, that's a very good question. Um, you, you know, it, it, it's interesting because, um, I, I mean, the reason these things are myths, right? Like the reason they um, are still they get whittled down and honed down you imagine. And then after however many hundreds or thousands of years, they become rigid. And I think it's because they're all true. There's, there are these vectors in them, these experiences that just kind of hit on some element of what it is to be a person. Um, And so I I think um, what you're identifying, I think is um, that there, there is some um, uh, resonance, some rhyming between, any one of these characters and, and one of those vectors. Um, mm-hmm. I think we talked about it the last time that, that to me, a story is three-dimensional. You, you kind of have to be able to move it around. Um, yeah. And these are all true kind of from a certain point of view. Um, mm-hmm. If you turned the table around, um, they'd all look a little bit different. Like that That to me is where it gets both complicated, but where it feels right. And why it's it's not it's not remotely prescriptive. Like if you had told me all of this, and then I went back to the beginning and forgot everything I knew and tried to write a story based on identifying these people with these gods, it wouldn't be interesting and, and it would be impossible. Um, 
And so okay, weirdly, that's a big criticism of what I'm doing. <laughs> no, no, no. It's 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 actually not a criticism. It's it's interesting to me because I, um, in, in having to build them, I think if you're building, if you're building characters and they are fully fleshed out three dimensional human beings, um, you have to understand them as human beings. Like you have to be in it with them. Right. And so. I only know them as people. Like I know them as right. people who are fucked up and who are um, conflicted and and just sort of trying or not trying, I guess, b- based in the moment. And it's it's actually really interesting to see um, on a very accelerated time scale um, these people that I knew kind of in in my head and in, in the project now that they are dead and mm-hmm. and, and that they were kind of in your head. Um, finding these roles to sit in, which is how these things are built, I think. Like, once they stop being people, once they become a story, then then they can start to sort of gravitate towards um, something more um, archetypal, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's interesting hearing you say it, that it's sort of that that's where they're, they're, like, to me, I could argue with any of them, but it would be silly because (laughs) it's true. Like, what you're saying is true um, from a certain point of view. Okay. Having said that, can I now say my favorite one? No, please. Yes. So Liz, be prepared. This We're going to go into uh-uh. depth into this concept when we do our Flint character study, which we will be doing soon, everyone, um, with Andrew Dice. Hi, Andrew. <laughs> uh, prepare yourself as well. Um, <laughs> so my favorite one when I was reading also a book about Jung and, and Greek mythology uh, is one that I didn't expect I would see, and then thinking about it, I totally see, is that Flint is Dionysus. And I know, so I have to talk about this one a little bit, because yeah. I know that people think of Dionysus as just like, you know, like in, wait, what's, uh, in Fantasia. That's what I was thinking. Right? In yep. Fantasia, right. Yes. Called it. <laughs> Every, right. I know that when I say that, everyone's thinking of some like goofy dude with a bottle of wine and he's yeah. just drunk and a fool. Or he's very jovial, a very jovial drunk. <laughs> yes. This is not actually what Dionysus was in Greek mythology. Mm-hmm. Dionysus, um, yes, he is associated with wine, obviously. But what he's really associated with wine and the purpose, like the connection with wine is that Dionysus was was associated with our most primal selves, like the kind of wildness inside of us that could lead in many directions, that could almost lead in every direction, that can lead to creativity, that c- but can also lead to madness, that can lead in, you know, just kind of the depths of who we are. And this is part of his story, is that um, he was actually dismembered and eaten by the Titans, and then... Uh, we were reconstituted, we as humans were reconstituted from the dust after Zeus killed the Titans with a thunderbolt. And so the idea is that there's a spark of Dionysus within an, all of us. And mm-hmm. that spark leads to to basically all of our strong urges, all of our um, our kind of most elemental selves in a way. Mm-hmm. And so this to me felt very Flint. Um, he's also associated with with uh, a spark of inspiration to other people that through kind of the strength, kind of the power of his, you know, deep feeling, that's kind of where we get inspired. So for me, that really worked with Flint um, as, you know, when when he would get fired up and be able to inspire his crew. This worked to me as a Dionysus moment. Um, wow. Dionysus is essentially a god of duality, that, mm. he, that, that this kind of elemental urge within us can kind of go in in is so powerful but can be so dangerous and so creative at the same time wow um That's yes lovely. he's also he's also associated with change like with kind of the the like oh, force sure. the force that brings change amongst humans mm. uh he's also associated because when he was dismembered he was dismembered and eaten by the titans he is yeah. actually associated with kind of the same imagery as christ that he that he is um, symbolically like in in the rituals related to Dionysus, he was symbolically eaten. And, wow, that's and, fascinating. <laughs> so, and yes, John, you all did did do a bit of Christ imagery with with our friend <laughs> Flint. <laughs> when in when in doubt, exactly. Um, <laughs> you can't can't mess. 
So there's this blog that I found in the early days of Fathoms Deep called Sage Street on Tumblr, uh, which a lot of our listeners, I think, also uh, know it's really fabulous. And it analyzes the art on the sets of Black Sails. When I cast everyone, I went back to his blog to check it out. And he actually said that there were in the Hamilton's house, there are three tapestries. And it actually is Athena and and Dionysus and Apollo. Our, um, our set dresser is um, a guy named Tom Hannum, who is, um, is brilliant. And I like there were times when I would sort of um, just go play with him and say, it would be great if we had this or if this painting kind of um, uh, sometimes specific, um, sometimes not specific. Um, and then there were times when I would just walk onto a set and he read the script and he knew what it was about. And he was like, this is why I put these four things there. And it was great. Um, so it's, it's a combination. You can't do it all yourself. I mean, it's impossible. You can do a feature that way. Maybe you can tell your set dresser how to dress all the walls of all the sets you're in in a feature. But um, at the pace at which a TV show moves, not if you're doing the rest of your job, it's impossible. Right. So we got very lucky with him that most of the stuff he pitched me was actually kind of great and made sense. Almost all the stuff, he pitched me. all the stuff, Tom, if you're listening, all the stuff, oh, he pitched all me the stuff Tom. Not, <laughs> not just most of it. Yes. I think, um, I mean, like, like I said, I think, I think, um, I, I think of, of course that's true. I, I think to the extent that, that any interpretation of a story is defensible, it's true. And, and, and I think that, my understanding of it, um, just to, I will play back at you in the mythology yeah, game. Yeah, please um, do. The, 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 the version of it that has made sense to me, as you try to like zoom way, way out of the story and just see it as um, something that can be reduced to a dynamic, is, um, is, is Theseus and the Minotaur and the story about a, a person who has to sort of find their way into a place that is... Um, um, confusing and unintelligible and um, and find that thing that's hiding in there and then figure out a way to get back out again, um, which is, um, you know, we could spend hours and hours and hours talking about it. I mean, from my sort of very surfacey understanding of Jung, there is the part of you that is, um, that is aware, that is ego, that's kind of, um, that, that believes it's in control. And then there's all this other stuff and the stuff is um, sometimes it's can be dark and confusing, and it's a guy standing at a steering wheel of a ship in a storm, is the dynamic that 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 makes sense to me. And, and I think that the silver flint dynamic, when it really started to make sense uh, to me, at least in season two, was when it started to become that conversation. That it was a story about a guy who was trying to find this thing that's kind of in all of us, but the thing that was in this story as, as an embodiment of um, um, power and um, darkness and, but so there's something alluring about it, find it with it and then figure out who was going to be steering the bus after that. And when you get to the end of season four, that's sort of what it feels like to me is that um, it is a moment in which he's seen it. And he feels like he is going to move away from it. And the tragedy is, is that you can't, um, you can't put a lid on that. You can't walk away from the maze and pretend like there's nothing in there. And, and to the extent that this is a tragedy, I feel like it sort of needs to be read in light of the book, um, which is that he was wrong, that you can't walk away from this. And that when you walk away from this, the things it requires you to do will turn you into the greatest villain in children's literature. Um, it, wow. of all of the interpretations of things that, um, that make sense when that occurred to me or when I heard it, or, um, it, that felt true to whatever, to whatever mm -hmm. extent that that matters. It, it felt like a, um, if you were going to try to reduce this to, um, something that simple, that that was, um, that, that, uh, meshed with its, with the DNA as I understood it of the story. Mm. there's a few books that I, I made mandatory in the writer's room, which is not to say that everybody read them, but they were technically <laughs> mandatory. Um, and I think the show is a different show in light of it. Cause it was what was in my head. You know, it, it's, it right. was, um, uh, and, and, and there's a lot of stuff like that, that I think, um, it, it really is a different show in light of, um, in, in, in light of Moby Dick in light of, um, half dozen pieces of couple together, which I'm sure literally nobody, caught so i'm glad i spent so much time on it but still it's it's um <laughs> at some point if you ever wanted to go back and read it there's another show hiding under there 
<laughs> I think I think you underestimate how much research some people do. I mean, I feel like I'm starting to understand that like what we've done is actually not very much compared to what fans, some fans are doing so right true. now yes. in relation to your show. <laughs> That's good. I mean, I'm glad. I'm glad. Clearly, there are people who um, who it connected with, and and I think at the end of the day, that's really all you have any control over. Like, I don't have any control over how the show is sold or what it does or how it how it's mm-hmm. you know, received commercially. You just kind of want to make it good. And if it's good, then you hope somebody will connect to it. So that's good. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, yeah, we, we definitely can attest to many, many people who've connected to it and told us about that. All right. Can we talk about some uh, some of the references in the show? I know we have a little bit and um, you sometimes gave us little tidbits to give our listeners back then while while we were covering the show. I wanted to talk about a Odysseus, um, I do actually have uh, a listener who gave us a theory about Flint relating to Odysseus and to Achilles. Mm. Did you want to hear about that? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Because I feel like you also brought this up. I don't remember if it was after season three or after season four that you had talked about, about like essentially two basic stories, like the story of the hero who's trying to go out and uh, make his yeah, name. I, and- so I have... Um- I learned a little bit about Greek mythology um, from Mrs. Edelman in fifth grade. Um, <laughs> and I learned a fair amount about Greek mythology from a class I took in college on uh, the classics. And a thing that stuck with me, like I feel like, you know, 20 years later, the stuff you remember is probably the stuff worth remembering, um, mm-hmm. is um, that um, uh, the Iliad is a story um, about uh, the two in Greek, it's Nostos and Kleos. Kleos is um, glory seeking and Nostos is homecoming. And in that is kind of all of drama. Um, Achilles yeah. is a glory seeker um, who is kind of, a, there, there is no, um, there is no pull for him towards um, domestic life or towards going home. Um, and the Odyssey is all about, that's all it's about is going home. Mm-hmm. Um, and to me, when I get, um, nervous or confused about a story, I try to figure out where those two pieces are, um, are in the orbit of whatever the central character dynamic is. Um, cause it tends to clarify things. Wow. Um, and I think, um, there is some of, as much as you can reduce, uh, Flint and Silver to some kind of Jungian conversation between Ego and Ski, I, I think, um, there is that too. You know, I think that it, it at the end and forth throughout, it's a story about, um, we talked about domesticity, but um, to what extent can that be sacrificed? Something else, something that isn't homecoming. And, you know, even when that dial is ratcheted all the way up to, to, um, to a spinal tap 11 on changing the entire world, would you trade your wife for it? Would you trade your kids for it? Um, I don't know. People do. You know, um, and and I think that nobody knows until they're they're in that moment. Um, but it's hard. You know, I, I had fears all the way through season four that Silver was going to come off as being really hard to like for lack of courage. Sure. And in in the face of 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 this decision he was making, and at every moment um, where that really got scary, um, I kind of had to ask myself, what would you trade your wife for? What would you trade your kids for? And I couldn't think of anything. Um, and maybe everybody answers that differently, and maybe that changes when you're really faced with it. And but um, certainly in that moment of thinking about it, um, that's drama. And I think that's all wired back to Professor Naja's lecture on Kleos and Nostos. That, that wow. In some sense, um, that's that is that is at, at the um, the core of the tension of being a human being is trying to figure out what's comfortable and what's important and when are those the same thing and when they're not, um, how do you reconcile that? Okay, so I have a question for you in light of that. Um, actually, one of our listeners who is um, Gemini Jade, she had actually, and you had just talked about about the Flint and Silver relationship being like a conversation with oneself. And she actually framed it as the two characters of Odysseus and Achilles being basically the two halves of James, like that, that, that Flint is Achilles and McGraw is Odysseus. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Sure. So like, um, right, which kind of makes sense if it tracks with with Flint and Silver as well. And so her idea was that basically Flint could never have his dream of of going home, of you know, of walking walking with his oar until it's a shovel. Um, and he or James could never have that. <laughs> it gets really it's very complicated with all the Jameses. Yep. <laughs> Um, that James could never have that. Like James McGraw could never have that until basically the death of Flint. Like that, that, that basically in the Iliad, Odysseus could never have go home until Achilles died. Like that the war w- couldn't end without Achilles dying. Right. And so that basically like that relates to the two halves of, of our friend James. You know, it's interesting. Um, this had never occurred to me before. Um, but um, there is um, there is something meta, I think, hiding under the 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 Odyssey structure in season three, which is that he thinks of it as home. Um, mm-hmm. That I think in in season one and season two, I don't know that he would identify Nassau as home in that way. Sure, um, yeah. Certainly not hearth home, right? Um, and that there is something that's both like upside down, but interesting to me in in thinking about it in hindsight that once Miranda is gone is when he attaches to the place as being the thing right. that's important. Um, yeah, maybe they took because my, when they she's took there, my home. Right. Yeah. There, there's always a possibility that they could have gone somewhere else. And the moment she's gone, there's blood in the ground and the moment there's blood in the ground, then mm. the real estate becomes, um, uh, you get emotionally attached to it. Um, wow. so I, I never thought about it that way, but it's interesting. Um, that, mm-hmm. that while it's sort of this, this very dark story for him, there's also this, um, pretty significant transformation happening between two seasons um, in terms of how he sees the island. John, you're not supposed to break no, my heart even more after <laughs> after the show's over. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> yeah, you know who I am too. That's the reason I like you. <laughs> but it is true. I mean, I think it's, it's um, I mean, obviously like a, a tremendous amount of, um, of sweat equity I think was put into to doing this but I think you hope that that's the reward that you find these things afterwards that whatever this three-dimensional model of the story looks like when you you can sit and look at it and you kind of turn it mm-hmm. a certain way and it's like oh, I never saw that before but um, mm-hmm. if it's built properly they're all there you know and hopefully there's there's more hiding in there somewhere yeah I, I've got to say I love I love the idea that you are looking back on your own story and also having really fun and satisfying insights from it that's so cool well that's i mean that's, i think that's why you you kill yourself over it is because you want it to be good you want it to stand up to that you never want anybody to look at it and i mean the seams are there we could spend you guys want to spend a few hours i'll tell you where all the seams are but um uh, it, <laughs> you don't want them to be apparent and, and i think you want to be able to appreciate it as something where the seam become um far less meaningful than than the substance mm-hmm Absolutely. It's funny about where this became conscious. Um, there, that scene, um, the moment at the end where Flint um, meets uh, Oglethorpe in in um, in Georgia, um, yes. when he sort of walked walked into that room. Um, there weren't supposed to be any women there. It was supposed to be um, Robert, who was, who was playing Oglethorpe and our guys. And there was just a moment where it didn't feel right, and it felt like um, I just had a moment of. I don't know who it was, if it was Mrs. Edelman or somebody else, um, sort of reaching out from somewhere in the subconscious that there's that three women knitting meant something. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if it's the fates or the Furies or whoever they are, but something about that felt right. But we didn't have any dresses and period yeah. dresses and the people who they fit on um, yeah. is a little more complicated. The first time director is told um, than just deciding <laughs> on the day uh-huh. using dresses on there. So they're actually wardrobe. They're, 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 they're three women from wardrobe who um in like 15 minutes through through those things on and came out because no one I think wanted to tell me that that was a dumb thing to ask for on the day. Wow. Um, so sometimes it does flow backwards where I, I think if I'd actually explained to them why it was important, they would have they would not have been happy. But um, but they 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 made it work. So um, <laughs> thank you guys for making it work. Wow. Um, but some, sometimes you do you just have a moment where, where one of these things reaches out and it's like this isn't the, the painting isn't right yet. You know, there's something about mm-hmm. this in terms of the way the, the mythology of this wants to work that um, it just won't work without it. And then everybody That's in wardrobe right. has a shitty day. Uh-huh. So. <laughs> but they were also superheroes that day. Yes, they were. They were. <laughs> they were. And they got their first, the back. They got their first acting credit. Save that show. Exactly. 
<laughs> director said he wanted I made it exactly. happen. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, I'm not really sure. How does anyone say no to the director who's also well, the that's, creator? That's probably it, as we kept the idiot showrunner from <laughs> flipping out. <laughs> that probably in and of itself is virtue. Hey, I got to say... <laughs> It worked for me very well. Yeah, yeah, I remember. <laughs> so I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm pleased. I'm pleased that it worked out the way it did. <laughs> Whatever they were saying about you behind your back. Exactly. <laughs> Delightful things, it. all I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm <laughs> positive. Not on that day. Uh, although I don't know, they got to be in Black Sail. That's pretty cool. <laughs> But it conveys something, even if you even if you don't know who the fates are and you don't know sure. what that story is. There's just something about that image that that um, um, you're hardwired with that stuff, and yes. you can't put words to it, and you can't identify it. It's in there, and it will buzz when you hit it with the right frequency. I think. Wow, hmm. that's great. Yeah, I love that. I'm so pleased you told us that story. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's um, I, I find things in weird places, so it isn't like it's um. I mean, there the only thing that that I think was deliberately designed to um, track anything like that was there was a moment in season three, beginning of season three where I didn't really know what it was going to be. And um, I, it just all started to feel like an odyssey to me. And that is mm-hmm. something that I spent a lot of time with. Um, mm-hmm. And so that that's one where it was deliberate and where it actually cracked the whole thing open. There was a moment when we were breaking, um, breaking season three where um, the, f- it started the same way Flint was out, you know, I think that was always the beginning of the season. And then he came back to the island and we couldn't figure out what he did there because we just had to get him to leave. And we spent a really an embarrassing amount of time trying to figure that out. <laughs> and then as soon as I kind of got to it, but the, the home, as soon as he doesn't go home, then, mm-hmm. then, you know, then it's, it's epic. You know, it's a, it's a, a big journey. Mm-hmm. So, and then everything fell into place. And then there was a bunch of stuff that I think the queen, I mean, once you start, um, uh, once you look at it that way, you start to be able to kind of put some flags on the road, down the road. Um, so some of it's deliberate, you know, some of it is sort of, you know, looking at what it, what an odyssey the odyssey is and sort of trying to put some pieces in there that look the same way. Some of it just kind of rhymes backwards. You know, I don't think the the queen or, or I mean, we talked about where the queen and, and Mahdi came from. And mm-hmm. that sort of had nothing to do with it, but it does kind of mesh itself nicely into the place they get stuck. Um, well, and then you get, and then you get me to like just impose on that all, all, all of this Greek mythology. <laughs> right. I mean, my my feeling about it is um, that if you're doing this properly, it should be adaptable, and it should sort of start to um, uh, resemble. And there, there are only so many different um, ways to tell a story that feels right. true. Mm-hmm. Um, which is not to say that there aren't very many of them, but they all sort of they will they will start to resemble each other. Yes. Um, and so I, I think that's part of it. I think there may be a lot of things in, in the show and sometimes I was aware of it. Um, and sometimes I, y- you guys will have to let me know cause I was not aware of it. Uh, <laughs> that's but, what we do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and it's not all Greek. It's all over the place. I mean, we've talked about, right. we talked about season three, Melville and, um, and all of the things that once you get into Melville, then you start sort of incorporating all of the, um, mythologies and symbol systems that he was using by reference. And, you know, there's a lot of little bit, you know, odds and ends of things I think that I found through him and through Edinger and through Young. So it's just kind of, a, I was going to say it's a tapestry, but that would, I think, give it too much credit. It's a, it's a stew. Yeah, we, Liz, Liz officially called it mythos goulash. Mythos goulash. Yeah. yeah goulash. That is what she called it. Goulash, <laughs> that's, what, yeah. that's what Liz named it. Just, <laughs> I'm not Which even I sure love. I know what goulash is, great. to be honest with you. But yeah, I think that that sounds it's, about right. It's stew. It's just, it's Hungarian it's, stew. That's all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's different for everyone. Everyone's recipe is different and it's the only right one. Exactly. So, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Well, you brought up Theseus. I wanted to see, um, actually, I think you, John, and Liz both know this theory. Alistair, you've not heard my Theseus theory. No, you've been but... teasing me with this theory for literally months now, Daphne. <laughs> I've been teasing everyone with this theory only because it wasn't fully baked. Um, but I think maybe it has become baked for me. And I love John again, like this whole, I feel like, you know, this is another episode we need to do at some point, like really delving into this idea of Flint and Silver being a con, like it's 
tell me first before you say this, like explain explain this a little bit more. So you see the conversation of Flint and Silver being conversation with oneself. So do you see that being Flint's conversation with himself or for both um, of them, like going in both directions? Mm -hmm. Uh, probably either. Um, I think in, in the sense that, that, um, that I meant, I think a self, anyone's right. self, mm -hmm. um, right. the, the part of you that, um, in becoming an adult, um, in some kind of functional way, um, begins to understand that there are darker things happening, um, in a place that you don't have access to and trying to, um, meet them and understand them and then try to come to some kind of terms with them, that that is, that is a relatively universal human experience. As another example, I mean, I think is, as an example of the way that sometimes these things, you just kind of, you're feeling around in the dark and then eventually you find a thing and it feels right. The very first way we pitched the show, I think we may have pitched the stars this way, was that um, at the end of it all, it was a story about a guy standing on a rock in the middle of an ocean, shaking his fist at civilization. I think when, when I was putting the pitch together, it just, it just, sounded right. It felt right. It made sense to the Flint we were talking about. Um, right. But I think that's the same thing. I mean, I think that that is that is an, um, an image out of um, someone's sort of Jungian dream therapy of, of the self trying to make sense of all of this other stuff mm -hmm. out there. Um, right. And I didn't know it then. Um, and I, I don't know that I, I, I didn't really start like really engaging with the stuff until season two or three. I, I didn't even know what that meant, but it felt right. And, and I think that um, in, in the same way, the Flint silver thing developed that way. And maybe that's why it was so difficult because I, I didn't really have the vocabulary to design it on purpose. You just kind of have to feel through the moments until they, they start to feel right. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it all, it, it all feels to me like that. It, it feels like a, um, a conversation, I guess, in which Silver is sort of a, a late participant. I wonder if I had understood it better if season one would have worked differently, if he would have been more active. And that part of the reason he's chained to a sofa is... Um, it is a John Steinberg issue and not a story issue of just kind of not knowing where to put him. I love that Luke, Luke also like talked about the change of sofa. That's a great episode. <laughs> that's a great silver episode, actually. <laughs> he yeah. said it the same way. And I was like, yeah, but that's what he talks to Eleanor. And it's really interesting. Yeah. I mean, you can uh, tap dancing. Um, if, if you can tap dance, um, you can, you can make a lot of things interesting that probably shouldn't be, but um and some of it's just TV. I mean, it's just just part of part of TV. I mean, the TV that I learned how to make. Um, you know, we made a mm -hmm. show um, that was supposed to be, you know, a big epic action show. We made it in a in an alleyway in Van Nuys. Um, you know, between a, a flooring warehouse and and so you had moments where it was like you have these two actors and you have that set and figure it out. Um, Wait, which which one is that? Oh, on on Jericho. Um, which, was, oh, really? which was which was really good um, <laughs> school for me. I love it. Uh, sometimes that's just kind of what it is. Like here are the actors that are available, and you just have to make this work. So, um, but I, I really don't know. I, I don't know if there's something else happening there that Silver um, in the story we wanted to tell hadn't found his voice yet, um, mm -hmm. and it might be that that I, I you know I think part of that kind of a story is that you don't um, individuate and, and you don't sort of give, uh, have an ability for your, that, that, that part of you that wants to reason things out to, um, to say anything until it's mature. And maybe the story's doing that too. I don't know, you know, that, that, um, that, that it needed to earn its way into the conversation. I think that's the more generous way of putting it. The less generous way is I was still trying to figure out what the show was about. Um, so <laughs> make of that what you will. Okay. Can I, can I now impose my, my little pet, theory slash rabbit hole that I've gone down Please. Yes. <laughs> forever <laughs> on silver. Uh -huh. Yes. <laughs> I have had this idea. Um, John, you know how this started? Because I, at some point, okay, first of all, I have to dedicate this bit of the podcast to our friend Carla, because Carla was the person who listened to all of my crazy ideas before Liz, uh, just uh, changed everything by saying we should do a podcast. <laughs> so Car Carla used to be the person who just listened to all of my crazy ideas. And I said, Black Sales, I only know the, I the only time I've ever in my life heard of a Black Sale was in the Theseus myth. Because that is part of the Theseus myth. And then I asked you, John, at some point, if that's the reason why you named it the show that... And it's not. No, nope. <laughs> it's not. Um, 
dating. Yes. I, yeah. I, so, but the funny thing is, like, I started with this thing where Carla and I were just talking about Greek mythology. Um, and I was like, black sails, like, that's a thing in the Theseus myth that at the end, after he goes and fights the Minotaur, he had promised his father that he would change the black sails of Crete I to love white sails so that his father would know that he had survived. So this whole time I was like, okay, how does Theseus, this is, you know, before we started the podcast, before I ever talked to you, John, so that you could tell me that all of my crazy ideas were not at all your intention. <laughs> um, <laughs> and before season four, for that matter. Uh, before, oh, no, no, this, this theory predates, this was like a during season two theory. Oh, wow. I think okay. this, yeah, this theory started and then I was waiting for the end of season four to see how, you know, if my theory, even though John said this is not at all your intention, I still, you know, this is what I do. I still <laughs> wanted to go forward with my little idea. Um, <laughs> but it kind of works. So can I can I tell you how how silver is this yes. for me? Yes, please. <laughs> and this actually kind of works with what you were saying about Silver not actually having a voice in the beginning. Something that's common to a lot of heroes in Greek mythology is that they either have ambiguous parentage or don't know their parentage, mm -hmm. right? Uh, yeah, 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 for sure. We don't know if Silver's actually an orphan, but he sure said he was. <laughs> I, I <laughs> so there's that. His, I think his parentage qualifies as ambiguous. Thank mm -hmm. you. I think so, too. <laughs> and then what what happened with Theseus is that when he reached a certain age, and I should know what age because I wrote down this theory, but whatever, at some age, uh, he knew who his mother was, but he didn't know who his father was. And his mother, uh, he had to go through trials to, one, find out who his parentage is and then prove himself to his father. Um, and is that the Eleusinian rights? Is that what that is? Well, that is in The King Must Die, which you and I both read. But Theseus does go to Eleusis, and, but um, The King right. Must Die version is way better than the mythology version. So um, now we're out of Mrs. Edelman and we're into Mrs. Bentner. Now we're in 12th grade. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> These are my awesome. little islands of stability of things awesome. I vaguely understand. <laughs> so, yes. Everyone should just go read The King Must Die by Mary Renault because it's amazing. And it's, yeah, yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful version of Theseus myth and was a very, very important book to me. Um, so I'm already very oriented towards Theseus, always. Theseus then needed to basically fight all of these bad people. And he used cunning to fight them. And that's how he proved himself to his father. So in my little story version, Flint is actually his father who I don't know how to pronounce his name, but it's like Aegeus. And the next stage for Theseus is that he then sacrifices himself for his people. What hap what's happening in the Theseus myth is that Crete, because of backstory that we don't need to get into, basically takes tributes of children from, from the different parts of Greece, including Athens. Mm. And Theseus decides that it's not okay to just send the children of other families and not the son of the king so mm -hmm. he does sacrifice himself for his people not unlike our man silver mm -hmm. um and then he goes to crete and the princess falls in love with him and offers him a way to kill the minotaur and what she offers him is the the technique she offers him is a thread mm -hmm. uh right. that he would take into the labyrinth which is a not tether. unlike a tether Yes, mm. to go into the darkness. Right, that's lovely. The part that I never quite figured out is who is the Minotaur in this story. So, but I think I figured it out now for myself, mm -hmm. is that the labyrinth is the darkness and the Minotaur for a while, I thought it was Flint, but I thought, no, but he's Aegeus in this story, in my version of this story. Uh -huh. I think the Minotaur and the darkness is actually inside of Silver. The, the tether like that. That, that Mahdi offered him was, was both of them talked about him entering the, the darkness of Flint. But I think, Alistair, it's you who kind of unlocked this to me when you talked about the Flintness. Mm -hmm. That, that, that the, <laughs> the darkness and the kind of the concept of the darkness isn't Flint himself, but this kind of larger thing that actually is in both of them. Right. Mm -hmm. 
And so the thing that Silver needs to fight is actually the darkness within himself. And the tether that Maddie offered him is the tether so that he could come out of that of that fight with his own darkness. Mm. But the last part of this story is that is that Ariadne, the princess in right. the story of Theseus, made this deal with him, but then he abandoned her. Mm-hmm. And so exactly that connection to another person that helped Theseus fight his Minotaur and make it through his own labyrinth is is a connection that he broke in the end. Right. And mm-hmm. in my view, Silver broke that with Madi as well. Yeah, and so that's agree. how that's how agree. that's how we explain the Silver of Treasure Island that he because he broke the essence of that connection. I mean, you all did show us them standing across from each other at the end, but right. but the essence of it had been broken mm-hmm. and that's how he can that's how he ends up returning to darkness. Wow. That's lovely. And that's my Theseus story. There's, it's always um, <laughs> that shot, the the last. No, it it, it totally makes sense. It, it's always struck me about that shot. The uh, um the, I think it was either a helicopter or a drone. I think it was a helicopter of uh, of Silver and Madi. Is that the last? Um, there's so much made of that relationship in two seasons, and the last time you see them, they're so far apart. Yes. Mm-hmm. And um, mm-hmm. I I feel like the way I would read a book is that if you tell me that they are that far apart, um, that that's important um, as a resting right. position for them, um, that they are both together but apart, that there is something that is, um, that is broken, mm-hmm. um, that, that um, if that shot means anything. And, and, and I think that um, you know, part of trying to get this to really um, hold up to as much scrutiny as you want to apply to it is shot selection. Um, you know, it's that specific. Um, it's the same as if you were in, in writing a book, it's the words you choose. And that felt, that moment felt right to me, it, that 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 was where you would leave them. These two people who are so connected, they're not. Um, the first time you're introduced to their relationship, they're naked on top of each other. And when when you're when you leave that relationship, they're just staring at each other across this void. Um, that felt yeah, right yeah, as a representation yeah. of the relationship. Gosh, absolutely. So there you go. So I agree. Yes. Yeah. Heartbreaking stuff. Really good. It was helpful for me with Silver. I mean, I struggled a lot with Silver. Like, like you said, you, um, that you were concerned about people with silver. Like, I'm not saying that silver story didn't work for me. It totally worked for me. It was very hard for me in particular because I know that you said at some point that the show was supposed to shift from Flint story to silver story. And I think for me that happened a lot earlier than for some people, Mm -hmm. um, like end of season two silver really was so huge for me because that's the kind of thing that just for me personally is huge. The idea, the sacrifice that he made, like this, this Mm -hmm. ability to, to find connection and make sacrifice for the sake of connection Mm -hmm. is just for me, narratively a huge thing. So from that moment on, silver just became really, really important to me in the story. Mm -hmm. And then it was really hard for me (laughs) to watch him go through his season four process, (laughs) but kind of, I guess maybe uh, imposing, I think that's the word I'm going to use, like imposing this Theseus concept on him, which I'm definitely doing because I know it wasn't your idea, um, gave, gave what happened with him, like that he had a tether and that he had connections and then almost in trying to yeah, preserve he them, the he monster. destroyed them. I mean, right, it's, a different, it, it's a different version of the end of that story is that you find the monster in the maze and... Um, and then you become it. Right. Um, well, that's the thing. So he'd never killed it. He couldn't kill the Minotaur. He had like put the Minotaur at bay in a way. Um, I think I think Mary Renault would have something to say about that. Um, but, <laughs> um, one way or the other. Well, I, he yeah, def- it. definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that's how she sees Theseus's story. But for me, it works as no, some that's sort not, of like that, that's not what I meant. You don't get to become the king unless the last king is gone. Yes, oh. absolutely uh-huh. right. The ki- the king must die. Yes, yes, that is that is the thread that that binds all the parts of her version of the Theseus story, and it's very beautiful. There, there can only be one monster in the middle of the maze, and and I think um, well. We could also say that that you know that baton was passed at the end of season four. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's weird. It's um, you know you're telling an origin story about the uh, you know about an iconic villain, and um, he's not a villain within the four walls of the show. It all requires no. kind of external 
um, interpretation in light of, a, of another book to make it make sense. But I think that was what we were hoping all the wiring would sort of come out of the back end of the house in a way where it made sense that, um, you know, how to plug that book into it and understand exactly how, how and why he became a villain. So, but yeah. that, but, but it all, I think it all fits into, um, into what you're talking about. Um, you know, that, that there is some experience he has when he meets this thing that is transformative and not in a good way. Right. I mean, and he, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, one of the moments for me, uh, Oh, I'm losing my touch. I can't say which episode this is. Ooh, <laughs> I, I, I don't know if I can either, but hit me. I'll give you. I'll give you yeah. a shot. <laughs> That's it. That's it. We don't podcast enough, Liz. I'm. I'm. I'm definitely <laughs> losing my touch. Um, <laughs> in the episode, let me guess. Okay, John, I'm going to guess, and you tell me if I got the right one. I'm going to okay. say it's three o six where Silver uh, kills Dufresne. Silver kills Dufresne in 307. You were mm-hmm. very close. Oh! Very close. Ooh. I'm totally losing very my touch. Close. <laughs> yeah. Damn. Now we'll I think that's pretty good. Extension I, I think... Final podcast edit. We'll see if that <laughs> that I'm leaving that in. Um... <laughs> I'm just happy I remember that. I stand corrected in 307 when Silver kills Dufresne. Um, but yeah, that when I kind of came to this whole Minotaur thing, that's the moment that kept coming to, back to me was the moment when he says to Flint that the thing that he hadn't told him about the darkness was how good it feels. Yes. Yeah, I think that that transaction from seven to nine, um, you know, from that moment of, of, of the violence first being expressed in that way and um, and then which is the beginning of the conversation um mm-hmm. it's it's silver's um entree into it and then flint's response which comes two episodes later which is to say you're not imagining it and this is what it's like to have to do this job um yeah i mean i, I think that's the moment where they 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 see each other mm-hmm. um or or at the very least they went, um and gets to the middle of that maze um and then in some respect i think season four is really about trying to figure out how to get out of it if season three is all about how to get to the middle of it. Yeah. And that feels right to me. Yeah. So to what extent, I don't know if we asked you this, like to what extent in season four, do you see Flint out of it already? Like I, my, my reading is definitely. I don't don't think Flint ever gets to leave the maze. I think that's sort of um, baked into the nature of what he's become. I I do think as a, um, like uh, not as a, um, as an issue of metaphor, but as an issue of, of storytelling, it was a challenge at the beginning of season four to not let silver take over the show. Um, <laughs> narratively speaking, you know, mm-hmm. I think in, in season one and in season two and in season three, the big dramatic question is, so is Flint's and the big dramatic transformation is Flint's and the show is built um, through him and around him. And it all was leading to a moment in which the big dramatic question was going to be silver's but it's Flint's show and, and, and yeah. that was meaningful to me too. And so there, there is some, some tension in that and trying to, it, I, I, the way I've made sense of it. And I think we talked about this last time too, is um, it's two stories. It, it's Flint's story and a silver story. And they are kind of braided together in a way, which they sort of look like one um, in season four, a silver story began to kind of accumulate mass in, in its own, its own intentions. It was, it was hard to keep them tethered together um, and not have them kind of start spiraling out in different directions. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. I definitely feel like you did. That's, that's my sense. I mean, I feel like that's a lot of what I've thought about since, since the finale is just kind of the interplay of the two of them and how, who they are in really like who they are individually, but who they are in relation to each other. I think it's almost impossible to think about one without thinking about the other at this point. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it is a moment in which the show is literally um, not big enough for the two of them. Um, yes. And so the, <laughs> the end is kind of preordained. <laughs> uh, that's definitely true. All right. Well, now we've covered all of the things, all of my crackpot theories. So we're going to move on to Al- to Alistair's to crackpot theory. Yes, that to, to my... That's where... That's okay. where we're going. Yeah, because Alistair Stevens, <laughs> you've been in, I know, you've been entirely too quiet during this podcast, and I'm just not used to it. I've been basking. Your thesis theory is well worth the wait, let me tell you. 
<laughs> I'm also halfway through The King Must Die. I'm, I'm a third of the way through The King Must Die right now. And, and Isn't it minute, beautiful? And I absolutely emphatically recommend that book. It's beautiful. In either of the episodes that we've done since the finale, I feel like you haven't really gone into this. I would like for you to talk to us now or bring up for us now your whole concept of how season four took on a, a more mythic tone. Yeah, I guess we first addressed this in the roundtable with Andrew and Lauren, and it seemed to me, firstly, while I was watching the fourth season of Black Sails, but then looking back at the shape of the whole story, I can see the roots of this, I think, in season three, a shift from a more naturalistic tone into a more heightened mythological tone that we're, we're paying more attention to archetypal conflict and archetypal characterization as we move toward the end of the story, which I think is absolutely appropriate. And and I know that when we talked about it in the round table, it was in the context of, and as the tone is elevated toward the mythological, we lose track of some of our kind of street level characters, but that is a very minor criticism. I think that this modulation of tone makes the final movement of Black Sails as powerful, as resonant, as as, as fundamentally archetypal as it is. For me, I see the transition as being away from a more naturalistic depiction of the world. And as we move into first with season three, with the storm and the becoming and these kind of, of transitional liminal spaces, it, we're, we're getting away from that, that strict naturalism that we see in the first two seasons. And then of course, by the time we get into season four, we're playing kind of fast and loose with space and time and all of these these principles that have pinned the story to this point it feels to me by the time we reach season four as though the power of the narrative has gained such momentum and such magnitude that it is warping the world around it and it feels as though we are entering into the kind of mythological phase of nasa you know we talked a little earlier about this being the end of this period. This is the end of the golden age of piracy. Mm -hmm. This will never come again. And it feels by the time that we reach, you know, when we're dealing with Philadelphia and we're dealing with Skeleton Island and we're dealing with, you know, all of these disparate locations, when we're dealing with the, the Spanish fleet, it feels as though we're folding these ideas in on themselves and that we move from telling the story of black sails to telling the myth of black sails. And that felt to me, just so enormously powerful and enormously appropriate. And it's the kind of modulation that I feel most stories would fumble, honestly. I feel that most stories would, would even if they were ambitious enough to attempt it, it would read as unearned. But because we build through season three into this, this higher, more, I'm using higher, and I don't want to render that in, in strictly qualitative terms, but, but a more heightened register, it feels to me as though Black Sails really takes on a momentum that is mythic in its aspect, that is epic in its aspect. Mm -hmm. And I guess my open question to you, John, is, yeah? Is, is that true? <laughs> is there anything there? Um, is that an intentional shift? I, I think, um, so to um, re reflect that back at you, I guess, with, with a, a different perspective, I think that, um, I will say this, it's gonna sound defensive, it's not. It's actually meant to contextualize this. There is no time cut I can't defend. There is no time cut in any in any oh, in sure, any sure. in any moment. So it is still sort of conforming to being within the the four walls of the laws of space and time. That said, mm -hmm. I think what if I had to um if I had to try and diagnose, it feels like what you are feeling is the um the momentum of the narrative coming up mm -hmm. in the mix. And um, the periodic tap dancing and sort of um, uh, hole patching and 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 um, uh, grasping for momentum for its own sake, um, which is the process of making any movie or show or whatever, um, is always a part of the mix. Like how much of your story is about your story, the story you feel in your gut, and how much of it is um, entertainment. And I think at some point at the beginning of season three, um, I started to know what the story was about in a way that I didn't in the first two, which is not to say that I didn't know what the, where it was going or what was going to happen, but like what it was about in it, right. in its, um, in its heart and in its DNA. And I think once you have, um, once you have a saddle and some, and reins on that thing, mm -hmm. um, the story starts to change because it starts to become more about that. It's, it's, it's not having to do and tell that story. 
Um, I'm an opera guy. I, 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 I like it. Um, I, I'm not terribly well versed in it, but I am the, the stuff I like about it is, is, um, it, it influences the way I think about story. Um, and that's all that, you know, that, that's, that is like find an emotion, write it for all it's worth and nothing else matters. And, um, and I think there is some measure of in season three, we kind of figured out what the opera was about. Um, mm. and, and so everything gets bigger when you can, when you have that measure of certainty, I think about, about wow. the, the moment you're trying to portray. So it, it, it's saying the same thing, I think in a different way, but yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't disagree. I mean, I think that the show in the first season to me was, um, um, some people think it works some people didn't, I, I, it's, it's not my favorite season. Um, and I think some of it is, um, is, was learning curve. The second season was sort of figuring out just how to do this. And then it was sometime around the end of the second season into the, th the third and fourth to me sort of stand as, as, um, as a, not a unit, because I think they're, they're both their own stories, um, but they have a different tone. And, and I think that's, yeah, that's what sure. it was, it was just kind of really um, getting it. It's hard, you know, when you see a great pilot, um, when you see a great pilot, because that's how hard it is. You know, it took two years to figure out what our, what our, the really the core of this thing was about to, wow. to get that on day one is like, it's why so many pilots is just, you have to have that bag of tricks. Um, sure. Cause it's impossible. And most of the time you're writing these things in six weeks, you can't write a novel in six weeks. You certainly can't conceive a novel in six weeks. Wow. Um, so um, yeah, it's uh, the, anytime I see a pilot that's even remotely close to understanding itself in that way, it's just, it's really impressive. Mm -hmm. Do you have a list of your favorite pilots? Can you pull out a few that you really enjoy? Um, yeah, um, I, I gotta say, I, I, th I thought the Handmaid's Tale pilot was great. Um, I agree. I th <laughs> thought it's a lot of some are doing different things. Like the West Wing pilot is is pretty close to a perfect broadcast pilot. Um, also agree. Yeah, I'm inclined to agree with that one. Too. Um, <laughs> with West Wing pilot, you could watch standalone and be like, "I saw a good story." Yeah, it's so hard. Because so when you are doing this, when you're writing a pilot, you are constantly um, there. Are, there are two things that are at war with themselves. One is if you end the story, nobody wants to see episode two. So you're right. you can't you're not making a movie. Um, at the same time, if you don't end the story, nobody's going to want to see episode two. Um, and I think because there's so much content, I, I do think to some extent the bar has been lowered a little bit. That that I will generally watch an episode two, or I think a lot of people which episode one is like yeah that's fine like i, I kind of like him and it right. looked cool and i laughed twice and like that's really where the bar is uh -huh. um but like in my head like the platonic ideal of what a pilot is is that it needs to do both like it needs mm -hmm. to end in a way that with all of the noise of its ending is also a springboard that transfers yes. all of that energy into the next episode and that's so hard to do Okay, I've, I'm sorry. I just have to argue with you. I th I think you totally did that. I'm sorry. Like you totally <laughs> which, did which that. Which one? Handmaid's Tale. No, you. Oh no. Well, you, so it's it's interesting. You're seeing. I mean, I, I had written a few pilots at that point. Um, you're seeing the instincts to have those those rhythms hit, right? Like you're mm -hmm. seeing the instincts to have this climax that sort of a asks at least you know n plus one questions to the number of answers it, it gives um you're seeing the instincts for it but there's just isn't like if i were to do that again i would there's a lot i would do differently and i think it's just from that like and a lot of times honestly like now i'm in new pilots and i'm having the same problems like it's you just mm -hmm. you it's very hard to understand a story well enough to um like i don't imagine a lot of people write great novels and they never touch the first 10 pages like they get to mm -hmm. page 300 and then they're like, no, the first 10 pages are great. I'm not going to touch them. Like yeah. you can keep going back and it's just 10 pages. Somebody from 10 years ago, at the time you get to the point where you really, right? which I think is also part of the reason why there it's not analogous to, um, to, to novel writing. It's this weird space between novels and TV. Wow. Um, right. Because you have to actually put that first 10 pages out before you know really what you wanted it to be yeah and not just out but like out out like you have to go pay people <laughs> to make it and like you have to like make all of the the compromises that come with production to get it realized like it's it's not even the purest form of itself much less like um so yeah i, I it, it's i don't I, I guess i don't oh you know it was a great pilot the americans was a great pilot um uh, this i've not seen yeah. so it has, just has a great look and feel and it does that thing 
it has a great moment at the end that both feels like if it was just itself and you never saw anything again, you would care. Um, but it is the um, kind of the substructure of everything that comes after it and the relationship between the, the two leads. So yeah, that was a great pilot. Um, but, but sorry, I'm just going to keep arguing with you. Flint killing Singleton is that? Do you, do you want me to rip my own pilot apart? I will. I'm happy. No, to. no, I don't. I don't. I just, I'm just going to keep arguing with you, John. How much time do you have? <laughs> oh. Hours. You don't have hours. We have hours. Yeah. Um, no, I mean that. I mean, look, that's the thing is you hope that you're always you're hoping that you're um you're you're covering over the seams with some something that people will look at some wallpaper that's vaguely interesting to look at for a minute but um but yeah i mean i think that's the that that's the challenge of it it's a very strange medium to tell a story with that much pressure and that much some um, practical pressure um yeah. financial commercial political um uh intra sort of intra process studio political with that narrative thing of having to kind of land on an ending that is also a beginning simultaneously with equal force in both directions it's hard so like okay now we're just going to go completely off mythology now i have now i have a behind the scenes question for you okay. how much when you did the pilot how much i mean i just had i just had my chat with nina so it was really interesting to talk about huh. like yeah. what <laughs> first of all she's awesome and Nina's, um Nina is awesome that is the truth nina, nina is awesome we had a little bit of conversation about like how much nassau was actually a city a real, you know, like a real physical place that she actually got lost in when she first arrived. And yeah. how much, how much, when you did the pilot, how much of what we know of as NASA um, actually existed already? Or did you all build just like a, a portion of it for the pilot? And then you mean that was physically build? built? I mean, mm hmm. Um, well, we didn't. We didn't make a pilot. We we shot season one in a straight run. Sure. So That's what I we. Oh, um, so everything was so everything was already built. But when you did the first episode, not everything. I mean, it um, it metastasized um, season to season. <laughs> um, you know, it's it's when you when you make a show so slightly inside the sausage factory. When you make a show, the studio will assume that when you finished your first season. Um, you're not going to build anything for a little while, or at least that's the way a, a, a conventional show functions. You build your sets and now you have your sets. And we went back in season two with a, a construction ask that was essentially the same size as season one. Wow. And um, once we supported, um, I think that's part of the reason the show was able to blossom is that we were able to kind of make it clear that every season we wanted to um, build everything we could, we could fit in the amount of time we had. And, um, you know, that's a STARS cooperation and support and faith issue. And that's a um, South Africa practical, um, the things you can accomplish on there because of how good the crews are and how kind of um, how, fr how friendly the, the environment is, um, the financial environment. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, you know, we built, so I think, three or four scenes exterior. Like that's uh, that's border producer malpractice. But, um, you know, if you can, if you can do it. Um, <laughs> you you just you just want to kind of keep building it out. Nassau got bigger, you know. I think the the governor's mansion obviously wasn't there. Right. That was where the golf carts got parked in season one, and then the <laughs> golf carts had to get parked down at the. Um, also, I think I think my favorite. I mean, Nina had a lot of great stories, but possibly my favorite my favorite image from our whole conversation was the idea that that uh, Havana and Philadelphia were like basically right next to each other <laughs> in Charleston. <laughs> yeah, Charleston and Philadelphia. And that is um our our yeah. I, I think Philadelphia was um if it was a moment of hubris of how much can we get away with. I mean we knew we needed it for the story and but uh yeah, that was amazing. It's it, our our Wolf and the whole production team did things that I know no one is ever going to be able to do for me again on a show. Wow. Um and certainly not at that budget. So I don't Havana was um Havana the dock was right there, but Charleston and Philadelphia are on top of each other. Oh, okay. That yeah, that, I think that's what she meant. Is that the basically yeah. the dock of Philadelphia where we see Grandma Guthrie and Max was next to the dock of Havana where Woods. I mean, it's arrives. all it's all <laughs> a um, a sort of uh, a reasonably well hit three iron from anything else on the lot. You know, it's just not that <laughs> right. big. It's big for a set, but yeah, everything's on top of everything. Um, that was an education for me too, of figuring out how much stuff you can, you know, when you are um, smart about where you put the camera, um, mm -hmm. you can you can get a lot out of uh, out of that amount of space. Um, 
but it was big. I mean, we had people come in who um, are routinely on massive feature sets, and they were pretty blown away by it. Wow. So, yeah. That would have been yes. a thing to see. That's all right. It would have been a thing. <laughs> I think Craig, Craig and Lisa, yeah, Craig and Lisa invited That's us right. to South Africa to go have a party with them there. <laughs> on the set? That was very generous yeah. of them. It was I very know, wasn't it? Them. They were delightful. Yeah. I'm sure the, the good people at Cape Town Film Studios will be thrilled that they're... Uh, right. They're, <laughs> they're it's okay. It's okay. It's really safe for them to invite us from the U.S., there right. was rum involved. There was yes. quite a bit of rum involved. Copious. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, this has been delightful and insightful, as always. Thank you so much, John, again, for giving us so much of your time. We know how busy you are, but it, gosh, to get to dive into your mind a little bit and figure out how you put these things together is really fantastic. And Alistair, thank you so much for joining us again. Your uh, wisdom and insight is always welcome. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening. Again, from Common Room Radio, I'm Elizabeth Stevens. I'm Daphne Olive. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye. Steve is a Common Room Radio production. For more information and access to other programs, please visit us at commonroomradio.com. To show your support, pledges of as little as a dollar a month can be made to patreon.com slash commonroomradio. Join the conversation by using the hashtag FathomsDeep and follow us on Twitter at Black Salescast. We ask that you keep your tweets respectful and positive and please avoid spoilers. If you have more to say, we want to hear it in all its spoiler glory. Email us at podcast at commonroomradio.com with Fathoms Deep in the subject line. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.